thank them for inviting me. Thanks to Tom and of course David here. And uh, ubiquity. Gosh, I don't know that word would come up. I haven't heard that since graduate school. But anyway, ubiquity and economics is something that's everywhere available and almost valueless. So I, I, know, I hope you didn't leave it that way. <laughs> And Mr. Hasselbrook's question, I'd like to, before I forget it, I'd like to say there's uh, one of the impediments years ago, a number of years ago in Nebraska, was uh, welders, welders for the towers. And that's the community colleges. I think that's that's a gap we can easily fill. But why am I here would be the first question. I'm, my free market, I'm a free market economist. A lot of my friends that are I guess sort of friends are abandoning me now. They said, we just did a death penalty study and showed that it costs more money to have a death penalty than to have life without parole. You're, you've, you've lost it. You've gone off the rails. Now you're talking about how good wind energy is. You've lost it again. Well, first and foremost, I'm not a policy advocate. I'm a policy analyst. I did not say how to vote. I'm not saying how to vote on wind energy, but once I, I was a skeptic on wind energy, and I, once I dug into the numbers, particularly recently, it makes a lot of sense, and I'll talk about that shortly. But I'll give you, let me give you a few numbers, four numbers to be precise, 20, 6, 4, and 2. That's 20, 6, 4, and 2. Now those of you who do crossword puzzles will know what that is. 20 is the planning horizon for almost all uh, decisions, capital investment decisions of utility plants. Okay, then you've got six. That's the term of a U.S. senator. Four is the term of a U.S. president. And two, of course, is the, the term of the U.S. congressional representative. So today's election, I'm not going to, I have no idea who's going to win. I haven't even voted yet. I'll vote this afternoon. But think about, and I think the clean power plan, for example, one issue. And of course, other issues such as fracking becomes very important. Now, not so much for wind as solar, but nonetheless, if, if for example, let me give you a, a scenario where uh, uh, Secretary Clinton wins the presidency, we have a Democrat uh, Senate and a Democrat House, then you're likely to see big time pressure on fracking. So these cheap natural gas prices we've been seeing or perhaps no more. In other words, we would see an increase in, in natural gas prices, and that would change the matrix of decision making. Now, not so much for wind, but it would change it more for solar, and certainly for coal, and certainly for other uh, uh, fuels. So anyway, get uh, let's see, got one there. Now, if you here, look at natural gas prices and the price of uh, the Southwest Power Pool. And you see what's happened is, of course, the natural gas prices have driven a lot of uh, formerly profitable fuels to render, render them unprofitable. And that's what we're seeing. Again, look at that. We're, we're seeing, of course, uh, we've recently seen, and I certainly don't envy the job of these you know, ma management and board members of these power of uh, OPPD or NPPD or the other producers. Think about having to make a decision about closing for Calhoun, for example, what is going to be the natural gas price? Who knows? There, we do not know, and it has a lot to do with politics, and who knows? We don't, the pollsters can't even agree on who's going to come out ahead today. So it's very, very difficult. And I certainly don't envy their job. But you can see why, in some cases, how lower natural gas prices have forced the utility companies into uh, other decisions. Then looking at, now look at this, this is the cost. Nebraska cost is 38% is more than SPP wholesale prices. Now think about that. This is now, this is five plants that I, I received cost data on. Five Nebraska electricity generation plants, five of them, and you see there versus the Southwest, Southwest, Southwest SPP wholesale price, okay, which of course is considerably lower. So you see the pressure that these, um, that Nebraska power companies are under with the pool and the pool prices, the wholesale prices being lower. Of course, now, neither one of these include distribution costs or neither one just consider transmission costs. So you see the difficulties that our, some of the public power companies in our state are under right now with the, joining the Southwest Power Pool in 2014 where you have this cheap, cheaper uh, price of, of electricity. 
And of course, that price I heard earlier, $244 per megawatt hour. I mean, that's remarkable. I mean, in other words, and it's, it's and, and as Tom said today, I mean, I come at this as an economist, and I heard some presentations yesterday, and I'll give you some advice for talking to a, a, a free market economist, a free market senator. It's very true, of course, I think, about things like the environment, things like uh, global warming. But the big, if you're going to push a conservative economist, a free market economist, into signing on your positions, talk about the economic development. The numbers are on your side in terms of wind. Now, I can't address solar, but the numbers are absolutely on your side in terms of wind. The numbers just indicate that for, for Nebraska, there's a huge economic development potential, as ethanol was several years ago. How ethanol, what ethanol has done for Nebraska and then Iowa and Minnesota and other states, wind can do the same times X. That's what we're going to see. There's a huge opportunity in terms of wind. And even without, even without the subsidies, as the subsidies are feathered out or increased, you still see some real tremendous impacts, certainly in terms of these, these uh, uh, areas where you've been losing population, where you've had issues in terms of economic development, it's welcome. And, uh, and by the way, think, as people say, well, that's because the corn prices are so low today. Show me, you know what the corn price would have to grow to to make it economically infeasible for a farmer to go with corn instead of a wind farm? It, we've never seen prices that high for soybean or coal corn, soybean or corn, even one. In other words, it, you're talking about eight thousand dollars per acre per acre for for a wind farm that, that a wind farm a wind turbine that takes one acre with the with the highway, with the road, out of production. Now that's a pretty, that's a darn good number if you're a farmer. And I don't know how, if I were a farmer, how I would resist, even if, even if the sound is, even if we're like a jet engine out there, I would be something. <laughs> I mean, I would, you know those things you wear on the, when you're on the, I was in, I was in the Navy, I was flying, I flew, and you had to wear these things over the years. I would wear those to get $8,000. <laughs> anyway, so um, here, here you see now what I've what I've put placed here: electricity from wind from west, north, central states. Now those are the census states, and you see there. Let me see if I can get this to work. No, it's not work. But you see the percent of generation from wind, and this is 2015. And you see Nebraska is 8.9 compared to Kansas at 27.7, and Iowa is 35.8, and we all know that. And that, that looks like we've, we've fallen behind, but the beauty of it is we're catching up in Nebraska. And Nebraska is catching up very fast, and it's very good for our rural, particular our rural economies. Now look at the second column, uh, ranking installed wind energy capacity. Nebraska is 20. Now look across the way at the wind energy capacity. We're Nebraska's fifth, fifth. So we've got a long way to go to achieving the benefits of wind energy. Going, going from 20th down to fifth, if we matched our capacity, that's the, uh, of course, that's, that's addressing the wind power, the wind that's coming across the plains. And of course, Kansas there at number, number two, but fourth in terms of uh, ranking. Missouri has fallen behind and continues to fall behind, and I'm not familiar with what they've done recently, but Missouri is, is behind Nebraska in that, in that development. Looking at the next column, you see Nebraska, number of wind turbines, 540 wind turbines. This is 2015 now, and Nebraska was 20th at that point in time. And looking over installed wind capacity megawatts, 926 megawatts. So you see, those numbers don't look good for Nebraska, but the, the great thing about it is they're getting much better, getting much better, and it's, it's, it's a windfall. I, that's, that's poor choice of words. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a good good thing for Nebraska agriculture. And I, uh, for those who don't know, I do a survey monthly of uh, rural areas of 10 states, and Nebraska is one of those states. There's some real, I won't say hurting, but there's some real factors out there that are causing uh, just uh, economic development to, 
there's concern about economic development in rural areas of Nebraska and nine other states that we surveyed. This would be, again, I, I'm, again, I'm an analyst, not an advocate. I don't tell people how to vote, but wind energy, at least economic development speaking, is very good. So 926. Now looking at the next slide, here you see OPP and NPPD, they had, now this is comparing the Southwest Power Pool, SPP, the coal, uh, Nebraska, OPPD uh, together, uh, had 55.7% owned when it dropped in terms of their proportion of, of, of electricity coming from coal, 55.7, and then natural gas and oil, 20.1, nuclear, 20.3, of course, that's going to change, other, 3.3, wind, 0.7%, so less than 1% there, and that was, that's owned, but of course, with purchasing power agreements, as Tom was talking about, that increases dramatically from 0.7 to 7%. Again, in 2015, that number is going up as OPPD and MPPD signed purchasing power agreements. But look across to the Southwest Power Pool, and you see double, more than double, the wind energy uh, capacity there in the Southwest Power Pool. So you see the movement, you see the changes, and the changes, at least economically speaking, are welcome, and we're going to see more of that. And again, coal, and the, back to the elections today, the clean power plan of the presence, where we're pushing now, we're going from 5% uh, in, uh, to 30% of a reduction in uh, fossil fuel emissions. That's going to obviously push coal out of the mix in some cases. And you talk about the President uh, Obama took off uh, product, uh, dig, getting coal, mining coal in federal lands in Wyoming. Those things take, have impacts and increase in the price of coal. And again, it wasn't a small thing, but just last week, of course, we heard about another earthquake, a large earthquake in Oklahoma. Now, it hasn't been tied to fracking. But believe me, there will be people that will tie that to fracking. There will be intense pressure in terms of fracking for, new, for natural gas, and that's, that's a real key. And Pennsylvania, by the way, of course, has been a huge beneficiary of fracking. And as, as the polls are saying, that's a, that's a Hillary Clinton territory, at least in Pennsylvania right now. So you see there's some real issues. There are, appear to be issues to me in terms of natural gas prices and in terms of coal prices. I don't... I don't expect the Congress, regardless of parties, to pull back on coal, reduction of coal. Now, it may happen. I, I just, I, if you can predict, if, if you can predict Mr. Trump or Ms. Clinton, then good for you. I can't. Uh, and by the way, they both are giving us wink, wink, nod, nod. I mean, in other words, I just said that I didn't really mean it. Well, which is it? Do you, do you say what you mean, you mean what you say? Uh, you've all seen that. I stay up late and watch Seinfeld at night. Believe me, I'm just now catching up, up on the episodes. Because <laughs> remember that if you've seen it, he has this episode where he squeezes a grapefruit and gets in his eye, and for the entire day he's weak. So every time he, one of his, his uh, superior comes to him and says, "Where's Smith?" and he said, "Well, he sits out sick." And he winks, and hey, oh, I got it, I got it. No, in other words, that's what we're hearing from our presidential candidates. I'm really not going to be that tough on trade. Well, are you or are you not? I'm not going to be that tough on fracking. Are you or are you not? I don't know. But it does look like, again, there's pressure on fracking. There does look like there's pressure on coal to increase the prices of both those inputs, again, which would be beneficial to win. And if you look at this, you look at this, here's what my estimate, now this is 2013. And I, these are my estimates. Um, I did a study for the Platt Institute a couple of years ago. And this is 2013. Look at Iowa. The actual price per megawatt hour, 82.40. Without the subsidies, it would be $92.04. 11.7% reduction in price as a result of wind energy and a result of the subsidies. Now that's the subsidies. That's assuming the subsidies that were in place in 2013 go toward the price of electricity. Look down, and if you see Nebraska, it's only a 2% uh, reduction in the price, and that's simply because Nebraska has not added as much wind energy capacity as certainly Iowa. And Iowa has been, and 
I think I use this term in Iowa a lot. I, I, we do um, a lot of, I'm doing four anaerobic digestive system projects in Iowa right now. And Iowa, Black Nebraska, stands an opportunity to be a, what I'll call an energy juggernaut, the next Saudi Arabia, sort of. And that's a great, huge opportunity in terms of wind, in terms of ethanol, in terms of anaerobic digestive systems, in terms of all these things that we have a tremendous, tremendous, Nebraska has a tremendous, tremendous competitive advantage. You, wind energy is not going to, we're not going to see much of it competitively priced in North Carolina, except perhaps offshore. Think about that. It, it is something that we can do, Nebraska can do, Iowa can do, South Dakota can do, Wyoming can do, wind, and as was brought out earlier, the backward linkages. That's very, very important whether it's in the educational system or whether it's in the production system. There was a katana, a production facility in Columbus several years ago that I visited that produced towers for wind turbines. They were adding a second shift at that time. I'm not certain what they're doing at katana right now, but that was an, that's a, an industry. You want, to locate, you want to locate the production of wind towers close to where you're going to install the turbine. Because obviously, if you've met those, uh, tra those transportation vehicles on the road, you don't want to be transporting that across the U.S. So it's quite uh, significant. So you see the price advantages there. And that's just due to the subsidies. It does not include the advantages in terms of, of uh, uh, um, payment of, of uh, property taxes and other payments to the schools. Uh, as Tom said, and well, you, actually, uh, well, you said, but. In terms of whole county, the payments to the local fire departments, the payments to other uh, in other local entities are quite significant, above, over and above what the uh, farmer is getting, which ranges between five to six to seven thousand to eight thousand dollars a turbine. Takes one acre out of production, and again, think about what the price would have to be for that to be uneconomically viable. Because you're talking about 175 bushels of corn for that one acre, at best. 175 acres, 175 bushels. And what are you talking about? The production cost is at most $4 a bushel of corn. Well, there's, you better have some prices out there that are outrageously high to make it viable to grow corn instead of growing wind energy. So with that, um, I thought I had a, you can go to my website. I, it's www.gossonassociates.com if you want to get my newsletter, which is free and well worth the price, as the dean likes to say. Um, and it is well worth the price of zero. And it comes out uh, electronically. So, um, yeah, how about, David, some, how about some questions? Questions, anybody? To, to either Tom or for me. I was hardwired against wind. 
I'm not, you know, I thought it hardwired, but not against them. And again, advocacy versus analysis. My, my analysis said it was not viable. Well, then I dug in, I found out, hey, it is viable. And I think the same folks in your local area, whether they're, they're county commissioners, whatever, they will see the numbers and say, wow, that's a big difference. I, I now, I've now seen the light. But I want record is in the county paper letters to the editor. And numerous people told me if you really put a good article together in favor of, and like I said, you could ask Adam over here what they called him a couple different evenings at the meeting. It was quite embarrassing to me anyway to be a resident of the county for what them folks were telling him. And that's how negative the things were. Yes, yes. Anyway, I've been on my soapbox long enough. I appreciate <laughs> you being a veteran. I also am one. I hope you have a good Friday. Thank you. That's one holiday of the year that some of us have earned. Well, I had too much fun, so I'm not going to argue. Yeah, thanks for the good panel. Um, on the fracking regulations, can you say a little bit more about what specifically you might anticipate uh, in fracking re regulations and how they would impact price? I mean, you know, I've, I've heard that talked about in very general terms, but I've never heard enough specifics to really give me a feel for how much that actually would impact level of production of natural gas. In, in terms of natural gas, well, we can look at the, I, the only thing I could offer is look at the price pre-fracking and the price post-fracking, and you can see to some degree, but you're, I, I have to say I don't have an answer for that question. No. I mean, yeah, I'm just curious what, because, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's going to shut it down, um, but I, I, I well, it, it, as you as you're sort of saying, also, it's it's a local. In most cases, it's local. It's a local decision to be made either at the state level, at the federal level. Though you can make the decision on federal lands, yeah. but nonetheless, but I, I see some real pressure among those on the other side of saying fracking is dangerous to in terms of the environment, dangerous in terms of sound, dangerous in terms of earthquakes, particularly Oklahoma's getting a lot of negative publicity on that regard. But I think, I think even at the local level, you could see some increasing, like there was a pro, there was a ballot initiative in Colorado to stop fracking in Colorado. It didn't pass, but nonetheless, that's an example. I think we could see more and more of that coming, particularly as you see an expansion of wind, and you see uh, individuals see the opportunities of wind at prices, we know what the prices are, versus the, the price of natural gas, versus some of these issues. Now there are issues with, with wind as well, such as sound, the sound. There are individuals who've talked about killing uh, an, uh, birds, for example. Those are some oppositions. I grew up uh, in Georgia, but I, I lived in Tennessee. And the snail darter, the snail darter, halted production, electricity production in uh, Tennessee for many, many years. You think of a snail darter. No one, very few people in Tennessee ever knew what a stale dart looked like, but there it was holding up product, electricity production. I think it still does in Tennessee. So the, the idea that a bird could not hold up wind energy production, that's, that I think we need to take that into consideration. Well, the, you mentioned global warming, and of course the scientific consensus is pretty strong that, you know, it's here, we caused it, it's bad, and it's going to get worse unless we clean up our act. And I wonder if you as an economist uh, have a way of estimating the, um, the impact, economic impact, of the disruptions coming from, from that factor. From the regulations or no, from the, from the uh, extreme weather events, et cetera? No, I certainly don't. And, and the problem I see is that you have many cities, you have cities in California that are having uh, global warming initiatives. Now the fact is that Los Angeles tries to clean up, that's very admirable, but Los Angeles breathes the air that was in, in Beijing a few days earlier. So the idea that we can do this on our own is, is folly. That has, there has to be a collaborative effort. Now the President did go to China, the de President did reach an agreement with China, but you and I both know what, well, I'm not criticizing the Chinese, but I don't think that was a, there was an actual agreement, written agreement. I think it was a, they were saying we're going to do it. Well, yeah, you're going to do it until you find out it is cost, it is costly.
the cost of cleaning, uh, of, of soiling global warming does cost. There's no doubt about it. Now the question is who pays for it is a different story because folks in India are saying, wait now, you guys in the U.S., you enjoy 200 plus years of growth and now you say, well, it's time to look to the environment. We're, look, we, want to, we want to grow our economy like you did. And now you're telling us to clean it up and you know that's going to cut production so you're going to have to come up with some money. So there have to be some serious transfers of, of money, dollars, from the U.S. to India or from wherever to, to get them to clean up. So it's not going to be, it's not a costless procedure. It's not a cost. So global warming is it clean, may, moving toward away from, you know, away from fossil fuels right now is costly. It is costly for many, many areas of the country. So, but, but most of us would say, well, we'll pay it. Well, some would say we won't pay it. But again, I think the, the numbers here today go beyond global warming. I mean, that's, that's an issue I'm not, certainly not qualified to even talk about. And by the way, I want to, uh, I hate to one-up you, Tom, but I graduated from college in 1972. So, so and, and I graduated, now with the graduate school, and if you remember, and many of you don't, 1976, on the, and we, I studied global cooling. We, on campuses, don't look for diversity on campus. I was, we were not allowed to, when it's not global cooling, it might be global warming. Shut up, boy, sit down. You know, that's, I went to school in Florida. But anyway, uh, you can, it, that was the word. You could not challenge global cooling. On the front cover of the, the uh, uh, Time magazine was a picture of a, of, of, of a uh, what was it? It was, I got it, it was a polar bear. Wasn't it? No, it wasn't a polar bear. That was, a, that was in 20 years later. But it said, what are we going to do when the earth freezes? Now we're at the opposite. And I asked my biology friends, uh, friends in biology, I said, well, I said, what about that? And they said, well, our instruments are just better today. And I'm like, well, what if the instruments are better in 20 years than they are today? And say, so, well, got it wrong again. It was global cooling. It was not global warming. I don't know. I have not a clue. I would say it appears to be global warming to me. But I, this is that aside, the numbers are just on wind energy uh, side in terms of the cost factors. So I would, I, but it is. And if you want to go, if you want to get ousted from campus. Talk about global cooling. <laughs> do not talk about that on campus. You will be sitting alone. And I sit at the lunch counter, but I would sit there alone anyway. But, but if you, yeah. Do we have one more question? It, it, it strikes me that you, there's such a thing as opportunity cost. I'm sure you know a lot more about that than I do. And, you know, there is a deadline here. If, if, if the overwhelming majority of scientists are correct, I just think we do better to get off the railroad track. Okay, we'll take one more. Professor or PPD. Uh, either one of you could address, now you talked about the market uh, for wind capacity, and there's, but there's a viability and saturation level. If you have either of you, from your projections, looked at how much more wind, assuming we get additional high voltage transmission lines to the East Coast, with or without those, how much more wind might be available in Nebraska or in the Midwest? Uh, because the market gets saturated and then suppresses those prices, making that next wind farm a little less viable. So it isn't a linear right. market. Tom can buy. Yeah, so as we look at Nebraska and um, I mean, we, we still believe that there are, you know, opportunities for probably a couple gigawatts, you know, as we look at the, the R plan and, and transmission build-out. Um, you know, it, it is an area that, that we're continuing to be interested in. I mean, um, OPPD has an RFP out right now. There are a number of, uh, Grand Island does. We have other other entities that are looking for energy, and, you know, we, we can continue to see that opportunity and that growth uh, in the state and I think you know and that's in the near term um, you know as you look at uh, the different markets specifically um, Texas uh, they, and again I think it goes back to um, the, the public private partnership and regulatory wise uh, you know what does Nebraska want to be when we look at Texas
Texas, you know, they are the leader in the in um, the nation as far as install capacity, and we're continuing to see you know multiple gigawatts being installed in Texas. But that's because there was a, a, a strong commitment to to build out what what's called the, the crest lines, the competitive renewable energy zones, where it actually built the transmission to your point to move that energy to the load zone. So. Um, you know, I think it, as we look at Nebraska, there are those opportunities. But then again, I think it's a balance of, you know, how do you how do you build transmission and how is that paid for to get into the load zones? And I would add in there one thing we didn't talk about is sort of related is what does OPPD, NPPD, and other Nebraska producers do with stranded fossil fuel electricity generation facilities? What is done? The decommissioning you have decommissioning fund for the nuclear, but what about coal? What about other plants? As prices come down, certainly in terms of the Southwest Power Pool, what do you, what is done about that? Who holds? Who's going to hold the bag there? Is it the ratepayers or is it the bondholders? And I don't know the answer. I, and and I, I, don't, I don't mean to end with that depressing thought, but that is, that is something we've got to think about. And I know the management at OPPD and NPPD have been thinking much about that, about the what well, what I would call stranded assets. Now, stranded asset. As you know, uh, Fort Calhoun has been closed, but Sheldon Station has also been not generating electricity. I don't know how long that's been going on, but they're not generating. They're, they're there because you have, as a rule of Southwest Power Pool, you have to have that production capacity, but you don't have to be generating electricity. So what's done about that? Does Sheldon Station continue to sit there and not generate electricity? I don't know the answer. Perhaps you do. I don't have that. <laughs> all right, good. Well, all right, super, thanks. All right, good. Well, we need to move on to uh, the all-important coffee break. So um, that will start now, and um, we'll resume in 10 minutes.